Welcome to the RecWatch YouTube channel. I'm Chris Atkins, and this is our very first episode of our Sunken Live series. And I'm very excited because today we are talking with my very good friend, a well-known diver from the Sea Hunters and Dive Detectives and many other things, Mike Fletcher. Mike, uh, thank you very much for, for joining me today. I know you're a busy guy and you've got lots of stuff going on, but let's go back just a little bit and, and let's talk about how did you get started searching for shipwrecks? Well, lots of people have the same story. There's just something about shipwrecks that gets people excited. It, maybe it's in our DNA, some, something related to our past, but shipwrecks set off alarm bells. I grew up he right here on Lake Erie, which is absolutely full of shipwrecks. Mm -hmm. They were just outside my back door. And uh, so growing up on a farm, you wouldn't think I would become a diver, but I did. It was just a, a natural synergy that, that comes from a kid with an enthusiastic mind. What was the very first wreck that you went looking for specifically? Whereas rather than just looking for, for anything you could find underwater, was mm -hmm. there something that you targeted and that you had actually uh, had, had gone for? The, the, the first targeted wreck? Yeah, um, it was sort of by accident, but everybody knows about LaSalle's ship, the Griffin, mm -hmm. missing here somewhere in the Great Lakes. And I was working as a professional diver drilling gas wells in Lake Erie, and we were swimming a pipeline one day and I came across this very, very old tiller wreck. And in my lack of historical accuracy brain, imagined it could be the Griffin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was super old wreck. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you watch and listen, the Griffin gets found every so many years, <laughs> but none of the wrecks proved to be the Griffin. Right. I fell victim to that. And uh, so the Griffin was on my radar as a professional working diver. But it wasn't until uh, the rediscovery of the Atlantic that I really got some notoriety. So, so tell me about the Atlantic, because uh, that's the, the Atlantic is special to me because that's when I first met you. Yes. And as a cameraman, that was my very first paid gig, is going out with you on your boat, the Kento. Yeah. And I stood on the, on the deck and you jumped off and I even climbed in the hyperbaric chamber with you with this big camera. And of course you inspired me to become a diver as well. So when you first discovered it, what was that feeling? What was it like when you realized that you, that you knew with the shipwreck that you could identify it? Well, if you are a kid growing up hearing the folklore of Lake Erie and shipwrecks, you, you couldn't help but know about the Atlantic. It was a uh, palatial steamer from a really interesting time in Lake Erie's history, 1840s, 1850s. And uh, I knew it was out there. I knew it had been discovered in the past, but clearly modern man had forgotten exactly where it lay. Mm -hmm. And it was a tip from the local fishermen who knew me really well here in Port Dover as the guy who would cut a net out of your fishing uh, per boat propeller. Yeah, which is a pretty important job. Yeah, and yeah. It, very important to the fishing industry here in Port Dover. So um, it was a tip from the fishermen and it was in the right area. I thought this could be the Atlantic. And it, proved to be the Atlantic and my life took a drastic 180 degree turn after that rediscovery of that shipwreck. So uh, I think that's where you first discovered that uh, finding a shipwreck while fun can also introduce a whole lot of problems uh, ab above the water uh, on land. Yeah, everybody's caught up in the romance of a shipwreck and uh, it it's funny, and when you get close to shipwrecks and shipwreck discovery, you soon start to realize that shipwrecks have this uh, effect on people, and it doesn't always bring out <laughs> their better side. Yeah, People get suspicious and jealous, and they get uh, very, very uh, secretive. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand that about shipwrecks until I found the Atlantic, and yeah. then realized not only how it had that effect on me, but lots of people around me. Now, did, would you say that uh, maybe books or movies or anything like that has influenced you as a young as a young boy reading? Did that spark your imagination and put that adventure in you? Yeah, I mean, it's there. Hollywood loves shipwrecks, Treasure Island. Uh, and in television world, uh, Sea Hunt with Lloyd Bridges. Yes, yeah. Um, who, uh, you know, it's kind of corny when you look back on it now, but 
it inspired me. It got it got me excited as a kid. So you watched uh, Lloyd Bridges Sea Hunt as a kid, and you would end up being the lead on the Sea Hunters. That's pretty cool. <laughs> well, I mean, Sea Hunt, Sea Hunters. It's yeah. a great name. Yeah. And you could see why Clive Cussler would be drawn to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we we my son and I, Warren, yeah. uh, work with Clive Cussler, and so I went from Sea Hunt with Lloyd Bridges in my fantasy world to the Sea Hunters with the real live author Clive Cussler and of course my son. So I know a lot of people uh, watching shows like that, especially nowadays with so much of this reality TV that's where the, the scenarios and the situations are manufactured, but uh, especially during the days of the Sea Hunters, that was a real, those were real expeditions. Mm -hmm. And that's where you weren't hired to, to look good on camera, but they, you know, Clive Custler wanted you because you had the skills and the know-how to actually do, to do the things that needed to be done, right, yeah. to get out there. Yeah, the Sea Hunters, the television documentary series, uh, was all about the truth and, and about real shipwrecks. Clive Custer was used to writing fiction where mm -hmm. anything was possible and the hero could solve the problem every time. But shooting documentary TV that is factual, mm -hmm you've got to really work hard at that. You yeah. can't just make stuff up. You've got to do your job. You got to work hard. You got to put in long hours and you got to know how to get to the wreck, find the wreck and get the story. What was the first wreck that you found uh, for the Sea Hunters? Well, I, I wouldn't say I, because it was always a team thing. Yeah. But um, then the first season of the Sea Hunters discovering Carpathia Right. I mean, history told us that it had been sunk by a U-boat after it having uh, rescued all of the survivors of the Titanic. Yeah. Uh, it survived that. It became, you know, very important in sort of the shipwreck world history because of its job in and its relationship to the Titanic disaster. It gets lost uh, in a U-boat attack in World War One. We knew if we could find Carpathia, we could not only tell her story, but we could tell Titanic's story. Exactly, yeah. So by finding Carpathia, uh, which was this exact location was unknown, that opened up the door to telling the story of Titanic. And that in itself was a huge, huge discovery. So when you, when you were able to identify the Carpathia, first of all, how did you identify the, the Carpathia? And what was that like knowing that you had found this important piece of history? Well, um, we had to find a wreck that mar matched Carpathia's uh, silhouette. Like mm -hmm. it, we knew that it was a liner, so we're not looking for an old war wreck. We're looking for a uh, you know 1890s style uh, to 1920s style ocean liner. Mm -hmm. uh, the wreck we found matched that. It was in the right location. Uh, we had found other wrecks that proved not to be the Carpathia, but all the evidence was there to, to prove, in fact, we had found Carpathia. And that evidence was just in the structure of the shipwreck itself, its yeah. length, its, its style, and uh, its location. And what was it like uh, working with Clive Custler? Because, of course, uh, anybody that, that is fascinated by shipwrecks and diving would know Clive Custler and his novels. Uh, but now to actually be in the field with him and meeting him in real life, uh, what was he like? What was he like to work with? I think anybody who writes fiction understands somebody else who is of fiction. Okay. So the one thing you do not do around Clive or couldn't do, he's gone now. Mm -hmm. But the one thing I learned very early on is you have to uh, be very genuine with Clive. You have to prove yourself to him. He does not and would not suffer fools lately. Yes. So once you won his, his um, respect, uh, Clive was a wonderful, warm and uh, inviting man and uh, I really really liked him and I really appreciated the relationship we had together it was yeah. totally based on trust so the first season the Carpathia was that the biggest wreck that you had found or the most important one during that first season well you know what what makes a shipwreck important I mean the fascination of Titanic is why people are so fascinated by Carpathia mm -hmm. so finding Carpathia that's a big deal but in terms of a great mystery and a um, a great adventure finding the Mary Celeste in Haiti was oh wow you know that was a great story yeah and it it was equally kind of um, Cussler esque yeah. you know a, a great mystery and a, and a great unknown 
by finding the wreck, we got to tell Mary, Le Mary Celeste's story and figure out why was this ship found abandoned in the middle of the ocean. Wow. Really, a, a, a truly one of the great mysteries of the sea. The Sea Hunters, Mike, uh, that, was your, that was your big introduction into the television world. And it wasn't long before you found some new skills, I would say, right? Is <laughs> yeah. that correct? Well, yeah. But again, it's, it's about being pragmatic. Mm -hmm. And uh, like any difficult documentary series to make, there's never enough money, never enough time. Yeah. And I just proved to be the guy who was good at managing time and money. And um, yeah, I ended up getting promotions in the television world to writer and director eventually of the series. Mm -hmm. And it's those last couple seasons of The Sea Hunters where I, you know, I really got to find that there were other things in life besides just diving. I, I seem to be good at making TV. Yeah. How many shipwrecks have you located personally outside of just the Sea Hunters, like in, in your career, yeah. how many? Well, uh, and I'm not talking about shipwrecks that other people have found. No, no, just I've the visited. ones that you've... Yeah. It, it scores. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say hundreds, but it scores. Wow. Yeah, I amazing. would say truly significant and unique, one of a kind dis discovery on my own, mm -hmm. approaching a hundred. Wow. Yeah. And, that, and that includes uh, a U-boat, I believe, right? More than one U-boat. More than one U-boat. Yeah. Wow. Three U-boats. Three U-boats. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that is pretty amazing. Just to jump forward a little bit uh, from when we first met 30 years ago, Mike and I were very excited to be part of the Lawrence Fishburne show, History's Greatest Mysteries, where we went to Turks and Caicos with yeah. our friend Sam McDonald from Deep Trekker. And so that was my first time being uh, in front of the camera mm -hmm. and actually, you know, I've been with you on some of these adventures, but always behind the scenes and observing and recording, but not truly participating. No. So that, that was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed that time. And I hope that we get a chance to head back down to Turks and Caicos at some point and continue to look for that U-boat. No, oh, no, it's a great story and it's based in real history. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm drawn to that. I'm drawn to dramatic history in the way of films. I love that's my first choice of yeah. any film is historic drama uh, but then again you get to bring uh, fiction into that yeah documentary television to me should be all about truth and all about facts yes for people who have never dove or never been on a shipwreck watching can you describe what is your feeling when you're descending on a wreck uh, that that you're discovering for the first time you've got a target that you've picked up you've looked at all the data mm. but you've not ground truthed it yet and you're descending uh, down to see what's down there and you mm. discover that it, it is it, that it is a wreck. What's that feeling like for you? Well, <clears throat> you have to be incredibly um, pragmatic. Mm -hmm. You can't assume it's going to be the wreck you're looking for. And then lots of times you see wreckage on the bottom with sonar. You finally get a grapple or whatever to hook into what's on the seabed. And now maybe you're going down hundreds of feet, mm -hmm. often in the dark. Yeah. Um, your first thought is, I'm not going to get excited until I know it's a wreck I'm looking for. Right. So, uh, but then after that, for me, it's totally professional. Yeah. You're just doing your job. Uh, you're doing what you're trained to do. You're descending into the dark, usually, and gloom and challenged by everything that is diving deep, the cold and lack of visibility. Uh, because good historic shipwrecks aren't always found in pristine conditions. Yeah. So you got to keep your wits about you that way. And then the joy and adulation of finding and confirming the discovery, that happens on the way up, not yes. on the way down. Yeah. <laughs> and when you can surface and you can tell everybody what you just found, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the sense of accomplishment, the sense of what it is, you know, you're competitive about, yeah. being the, the person that's part of a team that mm -hmm. finds a shipwreck for the first time. Yeah. You know, it's not unlike an explorer finding the, a new continent or finding the source of the Nile. Yeah. People are driven by these things. Yeah. Uh, doctors, modern um, academics every day are looking for uh, a discovery in science or medicine. It's exactly the same thing. So we've talked about uh, the Carpathia, the Mary Celeste, uh, the U-boat, uh, the Atlantic, and you have so many other discoveries that uh, we're not gonna have time to talk about all of these today, or uh, I don't know if there's enough time uh, to, to really share all of your adventures, but uh, give me two other shipwrecks that are very important to you that you've been a part of. Um, in terms of a magical journey, uh, the World War II light cruiser Dresden. Oh, okay. 
in uh, on Robinson Crusoe Island yes. off the coast of Chile. Yes. Uh, magical place, incredibly interesting historic wreck, lots of facts, and all of the people I met along the way in that adventure was, it, it, you know, it just stands out as the perfect story, mm -hmm. the perfect adventure. Uh, the Fernando uh, Landetta father and son team uh, teamed up with the Fletcher team, uh, Warren, my son. Mm -hmm. um, it was a great chemistry between the two father and son teams and just the magic of Robinson Crusoe Island. Yeah. And Willie Cromer, the uh, German archaeologist that we worked with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just interesting characters, unbelievable setting, and then a tremendously interesting shipwreck. Okay, so that's the Dresden. Give me one more shipwreck that uh, is important to you. Oh, gosh. Uh, I guess finding the USS Flyer in our series Dive Detectives, with, again, with my son Warren. Yeah. Uh, very important to uh, the U.S. military, mm -hmm. very, very important to any of the family members who uh, lost family on um, the flyer. A tough dive and really, really appreciated by surviving family members. Yeah. Uh, that, that's got to stand out. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, there's so many other things that we could tell and I could sit here and talk to you for hours. Uh, but you know it's YouTube world and we're just starting out so I'm gonna call this uh, I'm gonna call this the sunken lives interview with Mike Fletcher part one and there could be ten more parts we'll, <laughs> we'll catch up with you because I know uh, you know there's there's always something else going on um, you know uh, actually before before we wrap this up is there a wreck out there uh, and you can say or not say but is there a wreck out there that uh, that you are longing to find that, yes. yeah, what, what would that, what would that wreck be? Well, you know, after a lifetime of doing what I've done, there's a few wrecks that come to your attention and one has come to my attention. It's a war wreck mm -hmm. and it's got all the makings of everything I love about shipwreck. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm not going to say a lot about it. I, other than to say it's a great story based on fact, in a really, really tough environment. Mm -hmm. And it would kind of be the culmination of my, maybe my career. Right. Yeah, I'd, lo yeah. I'd love to see that one through. Okay. And it's looming. Well, Mike, I really appreciate you joining, uh, joining me today for this, for our initial launch of the Sunken Live series. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit the no notifications bell. Uh, we have a lot of amazing content coming up. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.